this paper is part of a much larger project in which I'm looking at about 75 years of speculation about what the relationship between nature and the city is. I don't, I'm not really going to talk too much about this larger project, but I'm giving you a minute here to see what some of the, some of the components are and, and what some of the sorts of texts that I'm working with and, and trying to synthesize. So it's an interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary project in which I'm dealing with geography, literary theory, liter literary criticism, ecology, philosophy, sociology, economics, planning, um, among other disciplines. I, I want to focus on a particular part of the project, one that centers on narrative. And I argue that, I argue that cities need narratives for entrepreneurial and political reasons. The entrepreneurial ne city needs a narrative to attract business and to attract affluent residents. It's, it, there's been a, a, our Chamber of Commerce has done a study of 70 or 80 cities in which it, it, it seems clear that the cities with the clearest and most compelling narrative are doing the best. But a city also, it seems to me, needs a, a narrative for political reasons. There needs to be some common vision around which political debates can emerge. I mean, just because we don't, just because we have uh, common aspirations and common visions doesn't mean that we're going to necessarily agree on the policies to get us there. But if we lack those common visions and aspirations, I think we're going to have a very difficult time of things. And so the images here are uh, of a, a series of texts from the 50s and 60s uh, and, and into the 70s, texts that I, I think are begging for an environmental reading or in some cases an urban reading, in some cases an urban environmental reading. And they, they constitute an, an, a, an important part of the, of, of the study. And again, I think you can see that it's very disciplinary, interdisciplinary. I think that cities may also need narrative for environmental uh, and ecological reasons. I'm, I'm very taken by this essay by Jerry Hogue that asked the question, why did narrative evolve? There seems to be an abundant evidence that the capacity for hearing narratives and telling narratives, absorbing tell uh, narratives and telling narratives is hardwired into the human brain. And it, obviously, narrative serves all sorts of different purposes, but Hogue is acting, asking particularly how, through natural selection, it would have been hardwired into our brains. And he makes the argument that since societies must not exceed the carrying capacity of their environment if they're going to survive, that uh, those the limits um, that that narrative serves the function of keeping us within the limits of that carrying capacity. He, he bases his, his argument on anthropology and, and looking at the, the rituals and myths of traditional societies. But then, then he points out that in our own day of environmental challenge, there does seem to be a tremendous proliferation of green manifestos of one sort or another. I'm actually taking the position that I don't think these narratives are working. And there's no, there's no guarantee that every civilization comes up with the narratives that it needs. Some civilizations may pass away, and ours may, in fact, be one of those. And I think it's quite interesting to speculate about why narrative might not be working. It, it may be the way in which both the arts and sciences have lost touch with metaphor and, and lost touch with narrative, have lost touch with the ability to communicate its findings to a general population. So the images here are, are, are to invoke string theory, which obviously I'm not going to try to explain. And also in the humanities, semiotics, that we have this humorous cartoon about. I think an, another reason why narrative may be not be working is, of course, there's always competing narratives. And there's a multi-billion dollar industry that is geared towards, precisely geared towards, encouraging us to consume regardless of what the carrying capacity of the environment might be. So I recommend to you a, uh, an amusing but really intriguing and provoc provocative essay that appeared in Harper's Debbie Does Salad, which is looking at the connections between uh, food television and, and, and pornography. So the ruling narrative in our own day and age, or maybe it's maybe they're dueling narratives, the green city narrative and this other narrative. 
but but it seems to me that really the the ruling narrative, and particularly among the creative and business classes who make the key decisions, is the one that Richard Florida is putting forth. Now about the creative class, the cities that can attract this cluster of creative uh, creative uh, talent are the cities that will that will do well. I have a somewhat jaundiced view of Florida's argument. Maybe it's just because he manages not only to sell more books than I do, but to write more books than I do. But it seems to me that the message that he has to offer um, isn't really needed by the cities that are going to succeed under this plan. I mean, New York City doesn't need Richard Florida to tell them that they're going to succeed if they attract the creative class. But this, uh, but on the other hand, the cities that are just so drawn to to the uh, to to the argument to the to the to the narrative, are probably are going to wind up not being very successful with it. In 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 fact, that Florida himself has said that many of these cities really are never going to be creative centers. Um, Florida described my own city, Cincinnati, as, as and its region as one of the greatest innovative and entrepreneurial centers in the world, with perhaps one of the greatest university clusters in the history of the planet. However flattering that may be to a professor at a small uh, Midwestern Jesuit college, um, I'm still not sure we're going to succeed in becoming a, a, a world city. Uh, fortunately, we didn't pay him $50,000 to give us that advice, but our Chamber of Commerce has issued a, a uh, vision statement, our region by the numbers, that seems very, very much driven by Richard Florida's ideas. And uh, sad to say, in all the metrics that we look at, um, the future doesn't look very bright for Cincinnati and the, and the creative class. But even more than that, Florida's dis dismissal of what he calls the tangible sector, that is production, construction, extraction, and transport, seems to me to be simply whistling in the dark in a period of tremendous environmental challenge. It's as if Mar Marie Antoinette had said, let them eat bites, as we're faced with the disappearance of agricultural land, global warming, that horrible collection of plastic in the Pacific Ocean, the end of cheap oil, the, the, the coming of peak oil, and then the frantic efforts to drill every last little bit out of the earth and the terrible things that that is creating, and then the, 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 the buildup of toxic wastes in the environment. I, 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 don't, I don't think we're going to be manipulating images on, on, on uh on, on computer screens uh, indefinitely. I think that we're going to have to, uh, shovels come to mind. I think uh, uh, the, so the tangible sector may, may, may become much more important uh, as we need shovels to dig in the earth and to grow our own food. So really maybe the question that we should be asking is, creative and innovative about what? And I think here historians are very useful because, and particularly urban environmental historians, because they've shown that what cities have done over the past however many years, certainly after, over the past 200 years, is they've been creative and innovative, and of course often extremely destructive and callous, but nevertheless creative and innovative about creating productive ecologies and about dealing with the precarious nature of, of these dense urban settlements. So, for instance, my own city, uh, an early booster said, how can Cincinnati, situated nearly a thousand miles from the seat, almost in the center of our continent, rival our great seaports? Well, they became a seaport with the, essentially became a seaport with the innovation of the steamboat that made the Ohio River an avenue of two-way commerce, and then by the system of canals that emanated from Cincinnati and connected us to the Great Lakes and, and thereby really to the, to the Atlantic Ocean. And at the same time, Cincinnati has been a real pioneer in water and sewer technology, particularly water technology, where we have a nationally award-winning waterworks um, whose origins go well back into, into the 19th century.
and actually in the paper uh the city that i talked the most about about is is manchester the the shock city of the early 19th century a, a city that that took this hilly location through which something like five billion gallons of water passed through a year and channeled that that water through a series of dikes and canals um, and mill races and mills and turned itself into the center of cotton production in the world re uh, creating an industrial revolution in the process of course again uh, I'm not saying that we are always really uh, r really intelligent about this and really uh, caring and compassionate about this Manchester also seems to be the place in which both the industrial slum and the uh, middle class suburb were born uh, born out of the horrible pollution uh, of the place but again uh, innovative and creative responses to a precarious settlement um, at least innovative and creative for the middle class if not for the working class and of course my my, my birthplace Chicago is, a, is is another good example of this uh, transforming one ecosystem the North Woods into the resources needed to uh, transform and exploit another uh, ecosystem the, uh, the, the 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 plains the Great Plains the Great West these images are obviously from William Cronin's wonderful book um, and and Chicago also an in, in innovator in dealing with the precariousness of these urban settlements, literally lifting the city out of the muck in order to, po to produce a sewer system, and then uh, uh, building an elaborate waterworks to provide the city with with uh, with sufficient clean water. And so I'm suggesting that uh, my my own city then should probably. Uh, let uh, Richard Florida go on his way, and and our narrative really ought to be about the about the poss possibilities of of, uh, of turning ourselves into a green a green city, and um, that's no panacea. Um, a, a lot of this discussion about green cities is 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 really still on the consumer end of things. Beautiful cities and nice parks and so on and so forth. Uh, but Cincinnati does have some int interesting initiatives going on. A civic garden center uh, that goes back uh, to the World War II period. Uh, a Finley market that has associated farms and fresh produce, farmers markets and fresh produce that goes back to the 1850s. Um, we are trying to clean up our Mill Creek, which has been the center of our industry, uh, developing plans for for intelligent development in the uh, in, in the floodplain of the of the Mill Creek. Our metropolitan sewer district is becoming a uh, a leader in in dealing with this problem of combined sewer overflow, uh, daylighting creeks and creating uh, uh, bioswales and the like. Um, our waterworks was awarded with a multi-million dollar grant from the EPA to develop its water technology innovation cluster. Uh, we're, we're, we, we may finally get a, a streetcar and move us in the direction of more and better public transportation. And some of the leading businesses in the city uh, are beginning to commit themselves to a zero waste program of one sort or another. So I, I think what we need is a, a clearer and com a more compelling narrative um, that can celebrate and, uh, and, and, and advance these various green initiatives. Thank you.